Well, welcome and thank you for coming tonight to uh, so we can have uh, Craig Smith talk about the book that he's written. And I have read it, and I think it's an amazing book and it's an amazing story. I want to thank Book Inc. They're, you know, we're big on hardback books here, and there aren't many, they're closing all our bookstores around, and we're so glad that Book Inc. is still in business here because they support our programs. Craig Smith has had an amazing career. He was, uh, he taught assistant professor at UCLA. Then he went to work for an engineering construction company. And then he headed up a, a very large engineering construction company, ACOM, with, and he had one, a firm that I'm familiar with when I was working for Bechtel, one of their competitors was Dim Jim. He ended up being the president and then the chief executive officer of that large company. During his professional career, he wrote over 100 technical publications. But when he retired in 2003, he started doing other kinds of writing. Although, as he tells you, as he'll tell you, he really started this book over 25 years ago. And I asked him when I, we were just downstairs, I said, why did it take you so long to publish that? and get this book out, and I think he'll tell you a little bit about that tonight. But the title of the book is Counting the Days, POWs, Internees, and Stragglers of World War II in the Pacific. Our chairman of our board, Steve Snyder, just called me and he said, read my email. He sent me this email. He said, I just had a change in my schedule. I couldn't make it tonight. But he said, if you want to read my email, it'd be fine. He said, sorry that I will miss this. I read the book thinking I could make it to the program. Events have frustrated the, those good intentions. It's a remarkable piece, a remarkable piece of work built on the author's effort, efforts over many years and reflects his firm commitment to finish telling the stories of a group of people whose lives were uniquely changed by World War II. I don't think I've ever come across an historical account that explores the similarities between prisoners of the Second War, World War who have such diversity in their circumstances, backgrounds, and allegiances. He finds common traits of positive thinking, resourcefulness, and determination of American servicemen and civilians imprisoned by the Japanese. American citizens of Japanese ancestry interned by the U.S. government on their own soil, foreign nationals like Russian citizens of a country not then at war with Japan, imprisoned by the Japanese, and Japanese servicemen who were imprisoned by the Allies, or even more remarkably, who were in hiding for decades on former World War II battlefields, such as the island of Guam. Please thank him for putting together this valuable contribution to the history of that war. I think that says it all. Would you please help me welcome Greg Smith. Uh, thank you, General Myatt, and thank you all for coming. It's a wonderful place. Uh, my company had an office in San Francisco, and I've been here many times, but I did not know this existed. And uh, I do hope if you haven't already had a chance to look around a bit, you, we will take op the opportunity to do that. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, a little bit differently, perhaps. Um, on the screen, there is a... Uh, picture of the POW MIA flag and I'd like you all to just pause for a moment and uh, step back in time uh, 70 years with me and imagine, try to imagine that you were a 20 year old Marine standing guard at the rear entrance to the governor's palace in Agana, Guam. You're holding a loaded and cocked 45 automatic it's very quiet, so quiet that your own breathing sounds loud. You ask yourself, how did I get in this fix? Then you hear a staccato burst of machine gun fire in the distance. Overriding that sound is a higher pitched one, which intuitively you know is a Japanese response. There is scattered rifle fire around the plaza. You can see bullets striking the Catholic Cathedral and realize that the inexperienced Guam militia are firing too high. 
The battle is a short one. There's not much your small group of a few hundred Marines and sailors and Guamanian volunteers can do against 5,000 hardened Japanese troops. When the surrender order comes forth, you break down your weapon and toss it on the ground. You move into the plaza under the prodding bayonets of the Japanese troops. As you watch, inexplicably, for no apparent reason, your friend, Marine PFC, John Kaufman, collapses and dies when he is bayoneted by a Japanese. Later that day, two other Marines, privates, William Bomar and William Burt, are made to kneel and are beheaded apparently for failing to move quickly enough to shouted Japanese commands. This is a stark preview of what lies ahead for you and your comrades. World War II in the Pacific has begun. For you, it is already over. What lies ahead is four different Japanese POW camps. You will struggle to survive as a slave laborer, beaten, ill, half-starved, but never giving up until that fateful day when Hiroshima is bombed. Until then, for the next 44 months, you will be counting the days. So why talk about POWs? Uh, I do want to mention one thing. Uh, even today, we hear almost daily acts of terrorists or acts of war where somebody becomes a prisoner or a hostage. Uh, General Myatt mentioned it took me a while to finish this book. I wrote the first draft in 1990, then uh, decided to change it around. I didn't like it. I wrote it again. But at that time, in right, the early 1990s, when uh, the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, my company, the group of my company, had a dozen people working in the University of Kuwait. And they were all taken prisoners by the Iraqis. They were driven back to Baghdad. The women were eventually released, but the men were all put out as living shields at Iraqi defense plants. And they were eventually uh, released, as, as you all know. But that just brought it home to me again, you know, that these were people who had the bad luck of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that sort of spurred me on to get on uh, with the book. And I think if you recall, just last week or two weeks ago, there was a story of some uh, man in Colombia who had been taken prisoner by the Colombian rebels and held by them for 12 years. So the other thing I want to mention is the situation regarding Japan. So Japan and the uh, before Admiral Perry's visit, of course, as everyone probably remembers, was a very closed society. After Perry came with his modern American naval vessels, the Japanese realized that if they were going to compete in this world, they had to improve the technology, open up. And one of their first openings was to the British. And they asked the British to build them some advanced warships, some destroyers. And from that, then they began to rapidly develop and improve the Japanese Navy. And of course, that came to fruition in 1905 when Japan uh, surprisingly defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. At that time, the Japanese had some Russian POWs, and they were all treated uh, in a very gentlemanly manner, if I may say that, in the sort of best uh, samurai traditions and eventually returned to, Washington, uh, to uh, Russia. But in the ensuing two decades, that all changed. Japan failed to uh, sign the Geneva Accords regarding the treatment of prisoners of war. And also, they, um, the army, as it expanded, the level of training of recruits, the educational level of recruits went down. and. Uh, at the start of the war, Prime Minister Tojo issued an edict saying that it was dishonorable to surrender, uh, death was preferable to surrender, and this permeated not only the Japanese military, their treatment of each other, 
but how they viewed the prisoners. So to their minds, the prisoners they had were people who were less than honorable because they had surrendered. So this uh, had a big effect on the treatment of our hostages and prisoners. Right after uh, Pearl Harbor, Japan had succeeded in conquering a vast area of the Pacific, as you can see in this chart, an area significantly larger than the uh, continental United States. And in the middle of that, the islands here of Guam and the Marianas and the Philippines is the area that I want to talk about. In my book, I tell the stories, as General Myatt uh, mentioned, of six prisoners of war. Three were prisoners of the Japanese and three prisoners of the Americans. The uh, first two that I will just mention briefly are uh, Simon Lydia. Simon is here, Simon and his wife. Simon was a, a civilian. He was a Russian immigrant living in the Philippines, married to Lydia. Theirs is a fascinating love story, how they came together and ended up living in this house in the Philippine jungle, where they were eventually taken captive by the Japanese, put in separate camps, eventually got out and got reunited and lived in the jungle, barely surviving till the Americans came home. Next is uh, Mitzi Takahashi. So my pointer's not working here. Uh, she was an American. Uh, born in uh, Santa Monica, went to Santa Monica schools, an American citizen, and along with her family and other Japanese Americans at that time, in April 1942, was one of 110,000 Japanese that were interned in 10 different camps around, primarily the western states. And then next is uh, Kazuo Sakamaki, shown right here. Sakamaki was the one surviving uh, Japanese naval man who was on one of the five midget submarines that tried to penetrate Pearl Harbor the night before the bombers came. All the submarines were lost. All the crewmen died, with the one exception of Sakamaki, who uh, drifted ashore on the beach in uh, Hawaii and was taken prisoner by the shore patrol. And he ended up spending the war four years in, in three different prison camps in the United States. A totally different story from uh, Garth Dunn. And so Garth is uh, the first person that I want to talk about. And Garth was a young Marine, as I indicated in my opening remarks. He enlisted when he was 18 and got sent to Guam. And he was a part of the Guam police force. And at that time, Guam was this idyllic island in uh, what you might think of like Hawaii 50 years earlier, very calm, peaceful, nothing much going on. But the biggest thing that they did was on Saturday night, if they were on a patrol, they might arrest a few drunken Chamorros, the, the local population, and put them in jail, and, and they'd release them the next morning when they sobered up. Well, that all changed with Pearl Harbor because the Japanese bombed Guam the same time, the same day they bombed Pearl Harbor, and of course they bombed the Philippines. And uh, several days later, as I indicated, they came roaring in and captured the island. And that was the first bit of American territory that was taken by uh, Japan. This is a photo of the governor's palace in Guam, and it was at the back of that palace where Garth was with one other Marine was stationed. That was his defensive position, armed with his 45 caliber automatic uh, when the Japanese invaded. Uh, I went back to Guam. I decided I wanted to try to see all these places where the prisoners had been and try to put myself in the physical situation that they had been in to try to better understand their thinking and what it was like. So this is the wall surrounding the governor's palace where the troops took up position behind that wall. Uh, as I said, I went back to Guam. And in the, all the islands in the South Pacific, you can see lots of relics from the war. Uh, when you visit these places and you see all this stuff that's left behind, you, you get a picture of what 
what a vast uh, conflict it was. And on Guam, there are many, many uh, examples of the Japanese fortifications that remain as they try to uh, prepare themselves for the return of the Americans. And this is what the uh, central plaza looks like today. Uh, you can see the uh, Catholic cathedral in the background. That was destroyed during the war, but been rebuilt. That's where all the Americans were held prisoner for the first 30 some days after they were captured. Uh, after the Japanese uh, got the island sort of semi-organized, they marched all the uh, POWs down to the wharfs and loaded them on this cruise ship. This is a Japanese cruise ship called the Argentina Maru. And uh, it was used to transport the prisoners uh, to Japan. So they landed uh, on a cold night and uh, they were marched through the streets and taken to this camp uh, here at Zensuji. Uh, Zensuji was actually a prison camp that uh, the Japanese had used during the Russian-Japanese War. And it was the only existing prison camp they had at the start of the war. One of the problems the Japanese had was that they were overwhelmed by their victories. They had hundreds of thousands of American and Asian and European prisoners and no place to put them initially. So they started constructing a lot of camps. You can see here some of the, this isn't all of them, this shows you the number of camps. And most of the camps where the American and Europeans came to, uh, they were used as laborers to replace the manpower that the Japanese were putting into the armed forces. The Zensuji camp, this is a sketch made by one of the prisoners at, uh, after the end of the war when he was debriefed. So you can see the prisoner barracks here in the middle and then the guards facility, then they had a cooking facility and, and uh, latrines and so on. Inside the camp, the barracks looked like this, this long wooden benches. The POWs slept side by side on those benches. So the camp routine at, at Zensuji, and this was sort of typical of all the camps that followed. Early in the morning, the guards would blow a bugle. Uh, Garth would tell me later, he says, I hated the sound of that bugle. It's the worst sounding bugle I ever heard in my life. <laughs> and they would have to line up and then they'd have to say their prisoner number in Japanese. If they didn't say it correctly, then they got hit. And uh, they were marched out, out of the camp, with guards taken up, in, in the case of Zensuji, up in the hills, and they were worked on creating terraces and rice paddies and, and things that was primarily agricultural work. They weren't uh, beaten too badly, and those, at that time, uh, Japan was winning the war, winning all the battles, and the food supplies were still not too bad, and uh, Garth weighed 175 pounds. Uh, after a few months, he was transferred along with uh, 80 other prisoners uh, to uh, another camp at Osaka. And this was different. Things were getting a little tougher for the Japanese, and this was harder work. But the one advantage was here at Osaka on the docks, they could steal food. And that became very, very important and more important as the war progressed and the blockade against the Japanese continued. Uh, then he was transferred along with 80 other POWs to another camp called Hirohata, which was near the town of Himeji, about 120 miles from uh, Hiroshima. And th the reason for the transfer was th this group of 80 uh, Marines and sailors became known as the 80 Oddballs. And part of that was because they had refused to load a hospital ship in Osaka with weapons. The Japanese were trying to ship weapons on a, on a vessel that was marked as a hospital ship. They refused to load it. They were beaten and eventually transferred because of that. And Hirohata, they had to work at hard labor in a steel mill, a Mitsubishi steel mill. And there the food uh, rations were cut way down. Uh, for one example was uh, 29 pounds of rice and six heads of cabbage for 80 men, uh, per day for 80 men working uh, at hard labor. 
And so for General Myatt, I brought dinner. <laughs> Two ounces of rice. That's, that's what you would get if you were at Hirohata camp. And um, it's kind of interesting. One night I decided to try the POW diet, and I cooked up dinner. And then one of the <laughs> I really got hungry later on that night. Uh, the beatings were pretty bad at Hirohata. Uh, one way was they would line the, the soldiers up, the POWs up, and slap their face with both hands, which was called windmilling, or uh, beaten with wooden bats. Uh, oftentimes beaten until they were unconscious, and then they'd stick them in the uh, fire uh, water pits. They had these pits in the ground with water for fire. They'd throw them in there, leave them overnight. But somehow uh, Garth survived that. Um, at the end of 1945, his weight was 118 pounds. So I went to uh, the site of the Hirohata camp. I had meetings in Tokyo on business. I took some days off. I took the train down to Osaka, then to Himeji. And of course, the camp was gone. All the camps were either destroyed at the end of the war or shortly after that. The town of Himeji had been completely rebuilt. Uh, the castle up on the hillside, it was spared during the war. Um, but uh, the steel mill had been rebuilt. And I went down and took a look at it. it, it I've seen a lot of steel mills. It looked like a typical steel mill, rusty, smoke, uh, slag. It looked about like the way the prisoners described it to me. There were some signs there in Japanese that said, don't take pictures. So I took a lot of pictures, of course. So next, uh, I'd like to switch to another, the other side of the conflict and in Guam. And this is uh, Masashi Ito. And again, getting to know Sergeant Ito, uh, I have to thank the Marines for that also. Uh, it was a very interesting, uh, unique experience. While uh, I was doing research on Garth and his friends, the people that had been captured on Guam and in the Philippines, I ended up in the Marine Museum in Washington, DC. I'd been sent there by a, a fellow in the Library of Congress who said they might be able to help me. And they were very kind to me. They gave me a little office to work in when I was there and um, arranged to get boxes of documents from the National Archives. So I went through these documents, and there was a lot of information about what we knew about the prison camps, even uh, in 1943 and uh, 44. But of course, there was nothing that we could do about them at that time. But in one of the boxes, I found a little leather-bound notebook uh, with a police report. And the notebook uh, had a name written in it, Lieutenant Pierce, obviously an American serviceman, and a few pages of English. But the rest of it was all written in Japanese and had a little hand-drawn maps of Guam and uh, American airplanes and things of that sort. And so that intrigued me. And then the police report that accompanied it indicated that whoever wrote the diary had been killed on Christmas Day 1946, you know, after the war was over. So I thought that was sad in a way. So I Xeroxed a few pages of this diary and took it back to Los Angeles and had one of my Japanese friends translate it for me. And it told this amazing story of this Japanese soldier who had been stationed in Manchuria. And then his group was shipped to Korea and then back to Japan and then on to Guam to reinforce the island for the impending American invasion. Then he describes what it was like trying to get ready for the Americans, then getting up early one morning and looking, climbing up on a mountain, looking out over the bay and seeing 600 American warships there, the Marines storming ashore. And in short order, the Japanese were driven to the north end of the island and um, defeated. So this, this is a page out of the diary, and you can see the map that I, caught my attention. Uh, it was clearly with a map of Guam. And uh, when I had it translated, this page showed as itinerary, describes how he came down from Manchuria and then uh, ended up on, on Guam. So when Ito climbed up uh, that morning to the mountain. The view he saw was something like this. 
and you can see all the warships out there. The ground is all scarred from the bombardment and so on. The Americans landed in two different locations and sealed off the Japanese who were here on this peninsula called the Arodi Peninsula. The other landings are close to where the Japanese landed when they took the island in the first place. And they drove the Japanese all up to this end of the island. And, um, but a lot of stragglers came down through their lines in the center part, which is really dense jungle. So uh, very few of them surrendered, uh, just a handful. And later on, after the end of the war, a few more surrendered. But a great number of them stayed in the jungle and refused to surrender. They were, in part, uh, uh, one group had been told by their commanding officer, don't, don't surrender, don't commit suicide, wait for the Japanese army to come back. Uh, so that was their last command. But also, as I mentioned earlier, it was considered dishonorable for them to surrender. And as time went on, they knew the war was over. There were leaflets that had been dropped that said you could surrender, the war is over. First, they thought those were propaganda, and they didn't want to do it. But eventually, they came to realize that, true, the war was over. But by then, they assumed their families had given them up for dead. They didn't want to go home and dishonor their families. They didn't want to commit suicide. So the third alternative was keep living in the jungle, which a number of them did. Well, after Guam was declared secure, the uh, American forces moved on. They went on to Iwo Jima and Okinawa and eventually prepared to invade Japan. So the search for the remaining stragglers was turned over to this group of Guamanians, which were called the Guam Combat Patrol. They were a group of young men who had been scouts for the Americans, and there was a lot of resentment toward the Japanese at that time because of atrocities they had committed in the last few months before the Americans returned. And they were ruthless in hunting down the Japanese stragglers. And my trips to Guam, I was able to locate some of these men and talk to them about what it had been like and how they had found and hunted for the stragglers. So it became very difficult for the stragglers to survive. And one by one, they uh, died in the jungle or were killed or a few surrendered. And what had happened on that fateful Christmas day that first caught my attention was that Ito and his friend and two other guys had stolen a cow in one of the local villages and driven it out to their hideout in the jungle where they were going to slaughter it and have it for a New Year's feast. So they butchered the cow and they divided it and the two guys left and Ito and his friend were there Christmas morning uh, cooking this cow and the Guam Combat Patrol, meanwhile, Came, was hot on the trail of the missing cow and came into their hideout. This is Ito's hideout. Those are some of the Guam Combat Patrol guys. And they uh, fired some shots. They killed Ito's friend. Ito managed to duck down and run off in the bushes and, and narrowly escaped. But when they found his diary, they assumed that he was the guy who had been killed. And so that's what led to all the confusion to me until 20 years later. So uh, later on, I found out that uh, Ito had actually survived. He and his, one of his friends had stayed in the jungle until 1960, at which time uh, his buddy was caught by some Guamanians while he was climbing a breadfruit tree. And they saw him, and they caught him, and they took him into the Navy headquarters, at, where he admitted there was one other guy living in the jungle. And so they went back and uh, called out, and Ito then surrendered. And the two of them went home and were heroes in Japan. It was a movie made about them. So after finding all this out, I, I then tried to find out if Mr. Ito was still alive. And he, he was. It turns out he was working as a bank guard in Tokyo. And so I was able to uh, get him to come back to Guam. And again, with the help of the Marines, was able to return his actual diary to him. And through all that, I was also assisted by a very patient and dutiful wife, my wife Nancy, who uh, made numerous treks in the jungle that she probably thought better of at the time. So Ito came back. Uh, these are some of the things that he had made while surviving there, living in, in a number of different caves. 
uh, when I asked him, how did you do this? Where did you get this stuff? He said, we, we found everything we needed to survive in the American's dump. <laughs> so here he was on the day of surrender, then cleaned up, ready to go home. And uh, between the news reports and his diary, I was able to go back and uh, find his cave. This is the diary that showed the, uh, some maps of some of his hideouts. And this is where he was in 1960, where we found this one right down here. And it was really a very clever cave, a sort of two-story cave. And if the Guam jungle is, is not like you might picture in Africa or something. It's just very dense brush, not really tall trees. And it's easy to lose somebody that's six or eight feet away. This, it turns out, is the entrance to a cave that had been used as a hospital by the Japanese during the fighting. We found uh, medical supplies in there, live ammunition, a lot of interesting artifacts. And then we found Ito's last hideout. And this is the bottom part of it. And then the top part was up here. You could stand up here and look out over the valley. And he had a water system there for catching rainwater. We found uh, shoes that he'd made in there, rat traps that he used to catch rats. They, uh, they ate a lot of fried rats, believe it or not. And uh, traps for catching freshwater shrimp in the rivers. So uh, when he came back, uh, we had a reception at the Country Club of Guam, which actually is now built on the site not far from where his hideout was. It was near, as I recall, the ninth hole. So the terrain had changed a lot. Uh, Ido also led us out on some uh, further hikes in the jungle, uh, showing us some of the places he had roamed and where he had, had hidden out. And a lot of this was right under the noses of the American military. And then at that point, uh, <clears throat> I gave him back his wartime diary, which you see in his hands here. And he gave me this wooden Buddha statue that he had carved uh, himself. And it was a very emotional uh, scene. So Ido and Minagawa uh, surrendered in 1960. Uh, it turns out they weren't the last stragglers to come out of the jungle in Guam. Uh, by coincidence, I was there uh, when uh, this fellow, uh, Sochi Yokoi had came back for a reunion because they dedicated a park where his hideout was. He surrendered in 1972. So you can figure that out. That's a long time. 27 years after the end of the war. He lived basically in this little cave that you went down with a little ladder and had a trap door covering it over. And uh, Mr. Yokoi was a tailor before the war. And so during his 27 years of hiding out in the jungles, he wove cloth out of coconut fiber and made himself a complete Japanese uniform, which is today in a museum there. But that wasn't the last one. <laughs> the record, as far as I know, goes to Hiro Onoda, who surrendered in 1974. So he wrote a book about his experiences, my 30-year war, he didn't surrender until, uh, well, there were suspicions that he was still alive in living in the Philippines and the island of Lubang. He wasn't in Guam, he was in the Philippines. There were suspicions that he was still alive and his brother came to that area and they set up a loudspeaker in the jungle and he called out and asked him to surrender. And he, he refused to do it, he heard it, but he didn't do it. And so he didn't f surrender until finally, uh, they were able to locate his former commanding officer, who fortunately had survived the war and was back in Japan. They brought his commanding officer to the Philippines, and he ordered him to surrender, and then he did surrender. <laughs> and he still had his original Japanese rifle and live ammunition. So back to Garth. Uh, now the war is coming near an end, and uh, Jap the J Japanese population was being told they were all going to have to resist the invasion, men, women, and children. 
would be uh, defending the Japanese mainland. And at the, a few weeks before uh, the end of the war, the prisoners at Hirohata were all marched out of the camp and up a hill uh, outside the town to a stockade. And there the camp commandant, who was a lieutenant, uh, told them all, if America invades, we will bring you here and you will all be shot because we will not have guards for the camp any longer. So that's what the, uh, the Americans, when they returned to the camp, said to themselves they would never make that trip up the mountain again. At that time, uh, Simon and Lydia were recovering their health. They nearly died from malaria in the Philippines. Fortunately, the Americans arrived in time to uh, rescue them. Uh, Sakamaki was in an American POW camp in Wisconsin and trying to figure out what he was going to do next when he went back to Japan. And uh, then there was the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hiroshima was only 120 miles from the Hirohata camp, so the prisoners there knew right away something really major had happened. And a few days later, uh, their work was interrupted, and they were taken back to the camp in the middle of the day. One of the prisoners was joking with another, and he said, well, you know, maybe the war is over. And the lieutenant lined him up out in front of the camp gates and said, the war is over, America has won, we are ordered to paint PW on top of the barracks. So the prisoners stood there for a few minutes in shock, then all of a sudden they broke ranks, they ran through the gates, they smashed open the storerooms, they cooked up huge kettles of rice, and they all got sick. <laughs> So uh, they, they were stuck there for a couple of weeks. Uh, they painted PW on the roofs of the camps, as you can see here. And eventually, Navy flyers came over and started parachuting supplies, food, and clothing, and stuff. And then they were eventually brought home. Some interesting uh, shots from the plane dropping the parachutes. And uh, at the time of the Japanese surrender, or the formal surrender, when it took place, they were still in the camp, and they raised this homemade flag uh, to celebrate the final victory. So Garth came home, uh, married his high school sweetheart, and went back to college at USC, and uh, struggled to get back in the learning f habits after four years or six years away from it. Uh, and then had a long, successful career in marketing. Uh, Simon and Lydia Peters immigrated to the U.S., and he eventually went to work right, here, right down the street from here at PG&E, which is where I first got to know him. Uh, the Yoshinagwas got married in the Manzanar camp and uh, went out after the war was over and struggled, but eventually rebuilt their lives. I already told you what happened to Ito. Uh, Sakamaki had an interesting career. When he first went back to Japan, some people wrote him letters and said he was terrible that he hadn't committed suicide, and others said he was a hero. But he eventually went to work for Toyota and then uh, became president of Toyota Brazil. Uh, the Zensuji camp commander was convicted of war crimes. Uh, the doctor, the camp doctor, who was very brutal, was uh, eventually hung. Uh, at Osaka, the camp commander was also sentenced to life imprisonment for war crimes. And at Hirohata, one of the very brutal guards was sentenced to 30 years uh, at hard labor. Uh, a number of the guards just disappeared after the war. Nothing ever happened to them. But there were a few that were, were tracked down and actually sentenced to war crimes. All right, I think I'm gonna stop there, and I'd be glad to answer questions. Um, anything that anyone wants to add to what I've had to say, I'd be happy to do that. And we can take questions actually from the audience if you all have any. Yes, sir. One right here. Craig, uh, between 1953 and 1956, my father-in-law was a senior naval officer at Guam. One of his uh, duties was to be the representatives of the Japanese government 
to find uh, the remains of Japanese soldiers so they could either be brought back to Japan for a term or to bless them uh, while they were there. He met with, uh, I have a couple of pictures that when my father-in-law passed away many uh, years ago, and we went through his things, because he never talked about this. There's a couple of pictures here. Here's my, my father-in-law. It's a couple of Shinto priests who were there. And another one, my father-in-law is a gentleman in the middle in whites. And uh, the other ones are all Japanese. They look like, like they have ties in it. They look like uh, Navy uniforms, but I don't think they are. And so uh, I don't know if you all heard that. The, uh, he was telling about his father-in-law being in Guam in uh, 1952 to 1956. 1956. Yes. And I know after the war in that time period, there were a lot of Japanese families who, you know, with their uh, last word they'd had from their sons or, or relatives where they were in Guam, and then the war is over and they, nothing, they don't know what happened to them. So it's, again, the classic missing in action, the Mias, that we all uh, still care about, you know. And uh, so there were efforts to find uh, the remains. Today in Guam there is a, a very nice uh, memorial to the, Gu ja the Japanese uh, people, uh, military people who died on Guam and, uh, and a, a shrine in fact to them. But these two photographs are very interesting. They show uh, your father-in-law along with some Japanese uh, people coming to Guam trying to find out, uh, arrange permission and find out where they could look for uh, some of the uh, people that had died either in combat or after combat in the jungle. I know that was true of the stragglers that I talked to too because several of their friends had died or early on had committed suicide and were buried somewhere in the jungle and they were the only ones that knew, knew where uh, that uh, might have been. Uh, I also have found in the, uh, the archives a letter from um, the uh, American ambassador to, to Japan writing to the governor of Guam, and this was in probably about the time your father-in-law was there, maybe a little bit after that, and it was saying, you know, we still hear these reports there are Japanese living in the jungles in Guam, and uh, could you do more to try to find them, and so on, and the, the American governor wrote back and said, there are no more Japanese in the jungles of Guam, I can assure you of that. And of course, two years later, up pops Ito and, and, uh, and then uh, Yokoi after that. Well, these are very interesting pictures. Thank you for, maybe you'd want to show them to people uh, after the break. Yeah. My wife has threatened me with divorce if they're not returned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, divorce is expensive. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, next question. Who has a question? Well, in China's, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Here. I had occasion to meet a young lady who in 1937 was on one of the inaugural flights of Pan Am to Manila, and subsequently she was interned there. And she uh, refused to go on the uh, commemorative flight several years ago when they were resurrecting that, and I asked her why. Uh -huh. And she said, because Pan American did not do enough to support their, their employees that were in, in, in turn there. And how was that possible? Was it possible to funnel money to give them a better lifestyle than some of the other POWs or the internees? Now, was she an employee of Pan Am, did you say? Her, her parents. Her parents. And they had gone on an inaugural flight in 1937 to probably from San to Francisco. Manila. Yeah, to Manila, right. Uh, well, it was clearly once, once the uh, Japanese had taken control, it was very difficult to do much for anybody there. No, but the question was, she in, inferred that some companies could make their lives more palatable than other companies did not. Have you run into any of that? Uh, no, I can't say that I have. Um, 
There were, of course, a number of American companies in the Philippines, and their employees, some, some got out, you know, at the last moment. Uh, some were later, in rare cases, evacuated by submarines. But uh, the Japanese pretty much clamped down on everything, and, and if you were found harboring and hiding an American, uh, you were liable to be shot, you know, so. No, it wasn't a harboring situation. It was a situation where if you had the bashkish, the money, you could make life better for the American internees than the Japanese. And that's my question. Yes, well. So what, how did that happen? Yeah, there, there were, uh, I talk about a couple instances in my book where uh, people outside the camps smuggled food or money into the Americans in the camps to help them. In, in the case of the people I talk about, Simon and Lydia, they were, they were actually not Americans, so they were eventually released. And uh, Simon was able to find $300 of money that he'd hidden when the Japanese came in, and he had that smuggled into the camp to help his American friends. But I don't have any knowledge of how f common that. I know it was very dangerous and hard to do. Yes, sir. So I'm curious as to what inspired you, given your background, to write this book. A good question. <laughs> Uh, well, what, uh, what started it was that uh, I, I knew several of these people who were prisoners. Uh, and that came about in a strange way. Uh, Garth Dunn, the young Marine, was actually a friend of my father-in-law. And uh, we were, I was invited to go with them on, several times on uh, trout fishing, the opening of the trout season in the high Sierra. We'd go up to Lake Crowley, if any of you are familiar with that. And Garth, after the war, became a marketing guy, and he also became a representative for the Stitzel Weller Distillery, which meant that he uh, was responsible for marketing bourbon in the Western United States. So as you can picture, uh, he uh, brought the bourbon for the fishing trips. <laughs> so one day, we're out in the middle of Lake Crowley. The fishing is dead. Nothing's happening. Garth had a couple of bourbons. and. Uh, Somehow the subject of the Japanese came up and he said, you know, I hate the Japanese. And I said, well, what's, why is that? And then he just unburdened himself so telling me about all this stuff. So uh, I got interested in that because um, I had been doing a lot of international traveling at that time. And there were, you may recall, there was the Achilles Laurel cruise ship incident where some innocent man was shot and dumped overboard. And, the TWA flight was hijacked and a, an American a Navy diver was shot and dumped out on the tarmac simply because he had an American passport. So I was thinking, you know, it's just like being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It could happen to anybody. And if that happened to me, would I, would I be able to survive? And what did these guys do that enabled them to survive? And at that time, I had also met uh, uh, Simon and Lydia and uh, so that was kind of what got me thinking about it. Thank you. Yes? I'm curious, sir, uh, from your perspective, of course, of 70 years, um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Are you seeing patterns repeated now in the Middle East or different treatment of POWs and Chinese and the approach to any lessons learned? Well, the, uh, the lessons learned, because uh, that was one of the things that interested me. <clears throat> and some of the things I saw in common among the prisoners was they all, <clears throat> pardon me, they all came from a strong family backgrounds. They had brothers and sisters. They were close together. They sort of supported each other. Um, they all uh, took care of themselves physically. So, you know, under whatever circumstance they could do it, they tried to maintain their health, you know, cleanliness and things of that sort, even though at times it was very difficult. Um, they, they were all sort of clever, ingenious, they could make things with their hands. Uh, they all sort of had a, uh, a common trait of pugnacity, if you will. They didn't really get along well with authority. <laughs> they resented too much authority. And uh, they uh, found little ways to resist, you know, and that, that kept them going. And then they had an indomitable will 
They weren't going to give in. They weren't going to give up. They were going to somehow survive. Yes, sir. I was interested in your comment about the fact that you wrote a complete book and then decided that that wasn't what you wanted to write. And can you tell me what made you change or what made you look at that book and say, this I'm going to put in a dumpster or something? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, authors and books and publishing, that's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, what, uh, I, I showed the first version of it to some people that I, I thought would give me some good feedback, and I said, well, Craig, it's kind of interesting, but nobody cares about World War II anymore. I said, you need to broaden it. So then I thought, okay, I'll rewrite this, and that was about the time when my, uh, my colleagues at Dim Jim had been taken prisoner by the Iraqis. So um, I decided I'd, I'd talk about prisoners uh, from the time of Attila the Hun to up to the Iraqis. And I wrote this long thing, and you know, and it, it was no good. It was too superficial. <laughs> I mean, the guys in Iraq, uh, they had a really great story as one example, but you know, that's too much junk, you know. They actually hid out, they hid out in, Bag in uh, Kuwait City for, for weeks after the Iraqis took control, hiding in this one apartment. The Iraqis somehow managed to kill the phone system, but not the faxes. And we were sitting in Los Angeles getting faxes every day from these guys saying, well, what's going on and where we are and all that. It's fascinating. They were getting water out of the swimming pools to drink. And they had some Indian uh, colleagues who would go out and get food because they, they could pass you know, for Kuwaitis in, in the city. But then at one day, the Iraqis came down and said, if we find anybody hiding out, you're going to be executed. And they came crashing into the building, and they were, they were taken prisoner. And the one thing my John Remington, who was our project manager at that time, told me afterwards, he said, it wasn't so bad. You know, We're on a bus. We're being taken to Baghdad. He and his wife, his wife was with him. He says, and then I see coming up the highway to Baghdad, some Iraqi soldier driving my car. <laughs> so, that really pissed me off. <laughs> so John and the other, the other engineers were taken out and put at uh, Iraqi defense facilities, as you, know, you recall the stories in the newspaper, living shields. And um, then they were eventually released. And when they came back here, they were debriefed by the Air Force and the Army. And that was a stupid idea of Saddam Hussein because they told the Air Force, well, here's where you bomb, you know, here's the vulnerable parts of all these plants, where to go. But anyway, so I scrapped that book and uh, get back to your question and uh, I said, I'll go back to my original concept and I rewrote it all again and uh, in uh, 2008 I finished it, I had wrote it and edited it and rewrote it a couple times and I gave it to my literary agent uh, that I had at that time who was in Washington and I said, ask him to see what he could do with it. And he screwed around for uh, two more years and finally I said, I kept telling him, you know, Ron, every year, you know, there's Band of Brothers, uh, uh, the Search for Private Ryan. Uh, Flag of Our Fathers, every one of these books comes out. And he was also telling me, well, there's no interest in World War II. I don't get it. So, uh, so I, took it, I took it back from him, and I was trying to figure out what to do with it. And then out of the blue, uh, Smithsonian called me. They had published the first book that I had written for the general public and uh, asked what I was doing. And I told them I was working on this book about prisoners. And they said, well, when are you going to be done with it? I said, well, it's all done. <laughs> so they asked to take a look at it, and then they called me back two weeks later, the head lady, and she just said, I love this book. We want to do it. And so the rest is history. It was a, frankly, it was a miracle. God smiled on me. I'm very lucky that they did that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any sense as to uh, how uh, our prisoners were treated by the Japanese as compared to the uh, the question was a comparison of treatment between uh, what the Japanese did and, and the Vietnamese. Uh, I think there were there was a lot of things in a lot of similarities. Uh, the Vietnamese were were very uh, brutal. Um, there was a difference in their philosophy. I think they didn't um, they didn't have the uh, 
to surrender is a dishonorable concept that was so permeated the Japanese thinking. Um, there was a lot more mental uh, abuse, I think, with the Vietnamese in terms of uh, what they did to prisoners, uh, holding them in isolation, you know, trying to get them to uh, go on uh, public media and repudiate the war and, you know, all of that, that sort of thing. Uh, certainly what they did was, was very, very, uh, very, very bad. Uh, the other difference was they did not put our uh, prisoners to work. The Japanese had manpower shortages, so they really worked people, and they viewed them as expendable. But maybe, uh, General Mahat, would you like to add to that? I really, uh, one of our board members actually served, uh, he was a guest at Hanoi Hilton for six years, and he was a talk about it. Herb Williams is his name, retired Navy captain, wonderful guy. And I would ask, I wish he were here tonight. He actually wanted to be, but he's back in uh, Tennessee right now. And I would defer to him to talk about you know, the kind of treatment he had. But I think that Mr. Smith categorized it very well, is that they didn't work the prisoners in Hanoi. And I think one of their issues was, you know, they were being, being beaten, but they were the idleness and the, the, the solitude and the solitary confinement and so forth. It's one of the biggest issues they face. But I don't know much more than that. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I tell you, I, I do recommend you buy the book and read it. It's very readable. And the way that you show the, each of these folks who were prisoners of this war, the Second World War, at different points in time, I thought was amazing. And I really enjoyed that. It's very readable, in fact. I hope you have a good bit of time when you start reading because you don't want to put it down. Mm -hmm. And then they're available here. And I, I know that Craig will sit here and sign it for you if you get one. And for the rest of you, have a glass of wine and we'll just talk about the book. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much.